Friedrich Max Müller, German pronunciation, Phi D C Max M L, the 6th of December 1823 to the 28th of October 1900, generally known as Max Müller, was a German-born philologist and Orientalist who lived and studied in Britain for most of his life. He was one of the founders of the Western academic field of Indian studies and the discipline of comparative religion. Müller wrote both scholarly and popular works on the subject of Indology. The Sacred Books of the East, a 50-volume set of English translations, was prepared under his direction. He also promoted the idea of a Turanian family of languages. <laughs> Early life and education Friedrich Max Müller was born into a cultured family on 6 December 1823 in Dessau, the son of Wilhelm Müller, a lyric poet whose verse Franz Schubert had set to music in his song cycles Die Schoen Müllerin and Winterreise. His mother, Adelheid Müller von Bastau, was the eldest daughter of a prime minister of Anhalt Dessau. Karl Maria von Weber was a godfather. Muller was named after his mother's elder brother, Friedrich, and after the central character, Max, in Weber's opera Der Freischutz. Later in life, he adopted Max as a part of his surname, believing that the prevalence of Muller as a name made it too common. His name was also recorded as Maximilian on several official documents, e.g., university register, marriage certificate, on some of his honors, and in some other publications. Muller entered the gymnasium grammar school at Dessau when he was six years old. In 1839, after the death of his grandfather, he was sent to the Nikolai School at Leipzig, where he continued to his studies of music and classics. It was during his time in Leipzig that he frequently met Felix Mendelssohn. In need of a scholarship to attend Leipzig University, Muller successfully sat his Abitur examination at Zerbst. While preparing, he found that the syllabus differed from what he had been taught, necessitating that he rapidly learn mathematics, modern languages, and science. He entered Leipzig University in 1841 to study philology, leaving behind his early interest in music and poetry. Muller received his degree in 1843. His final dissertation was on Spinoza's ethics. He also displayed an aptitude for classical languages, learning Greek, Latin, Arabic, Persian and Sanskrit. Topic. Academic career In 1850 Muller was appointed Deputy Taylorian Professor of Modern European Languages at Oxford University. In the following year, at the suggestion of Thomas Geisford, he was made an honorary MA and a member of the College of Christ Church, Oxford. On succeeding to the full professorship in 1854, he received the full degree of MA by decree of convocation. In 1858 he was elected to a life fellowship at All Souls College. He was defeated in the 1860 election for the Bowdoin Professor of Sanskrit, which was a keen disappointment to him. Muller was far better qualified for the post than the other candidate Monier Monier Williams, but his broad theological views, his Lutheranism, his German birth and lack of practical first-hand knowledge of India told against him. After the election he wrote to his mother. All the best people voted for me, the professors almost unanimously, but the vulgus profanum made the majority." Later in 1868, Muller became Oxford's first professor of comparative philology, a position founded on his behalf. He held this chair until his death, although he retired from its active duties in 1875. <laughs> Topic. Scholarly and literary works Topic. Sanskrit studies In 1844, prior to commencing his academic career at Oxford, Muller studied in Berlin with Friedrich Schelling. He began to translate the Upanishads for Schelling, and continued to research Sanskrit under Franz Bopp, the first systematic scholar of the Indo-European languages i.e. Schelling led Muller to relate the history of language to the history of religion. At this time, Muller published his first book, a German translation of the Hitopadisa, a collection of Indian fables. In 1845, Muller moved to Paris to study Sanskrit under Eugene Bernouffe. Bernouffe encouraged him to publish the complete Rigveda, making use of the manuscripts available in England. He moved to England in 1846 to study Sanskrit texts in the collection of the East India Company. He supported himself at first with creative writing, his novel German Love being popular in its day. 
Muller's connections with the East India Company and with Sanskritists based at Oxford University led to a career in Britain, where he eventually became the leading intellectual commentator on the culture of India. At the time, Britain controlled this territory as part of its empire. This led to complex exchanges between Indian and British intellectual culture, especially through Muller's links with the Brahmo Samaj. Muller's Sanskrit studies came at a time when scholars had started to see language development in relation to cultural development. The recent discovery of the Indo-European language group had started to lead to much speculation about the relationship between Greco-Roman cultures and those of more ancient peoples. In particular the Vedic culture of India was thought to have been the ancestor of European classical cultures. Scholars sought to compare the genetically related European and Asian languages to reconstruct the earliest form of the root language. The Vedic language, Sanskrit, was thought to be the oldest of the IE languages. Muller devoted himself to the study of this language, becoming one of the major Sanskrit scholars of his day. He believed that the earliest documents of Vedic culture should be studied to provide the key to the development of pagan European religions, and of religious belief in general. To this end, Muller sought to understand the most ancient of Vedic scriptures, the Rig Veda. Muller was greatly impressed by Ramakrishna Paramhansa, his contemporary and proponent of Vedantic philosophy, and wrote several essays and books about him. For Muller, the study of the language had to relate to the study of the culture in which it had been used. He came to the view that the development of languages should be tied to that of belief systems. At that time the Vedic scriptures were little known in the West, though there was increasing interest in the philosophy of the Upanishads. Muller believed that the sophisticated Upanishadic philosophy could be linked to the primitive henotheism of early Vedic Brahmanism from which it evolved. He had to travel to London to look at documents held in the collection of the British East India Company. While there he persuaded the company to allow him to undertake a critical edition of the Rig Veda, a task he pursued over many years 1849 He completed the critical edition for which he is most remembered. Scientific American carried his obituary in the December 8, 1900 edition of the magazine. It was revealed that Max Muller had in fact usurped the full credit for the translation of the Rig Veda which was actually not his work at all, but of another unnamed German scholar whom Muller had paid to translate the text. To quote from his obituary in Scientific American, what he constantly proclaimed to be his own great work, the edition of the Rig Veda, was in reality not his at all. A German scholar did the work, and Muller appropriated the credit for it. For Muller, the culture of the Vedic peoples represented a form of nature worship, an idea clearly influenced by Romanticism. Muller shared many of the ideas associated with Romanticism, which colored his account of ancient religions, in particular his emphasis on the formative influence on early religion of emotional communion with natural forces. He saw the gods of the Rig Veda as active forces of nature, only partly personified as imagined supernatural persons. From this claim Muller derived his theory that mythology is a disease of language. By this he meant that myth transforms concepts into beings and stories. In Muller's view, gods began as words constructed to express abstract ideas, but were transformed into imagined personalities. Thus the Indo-European father god appears under various names, Zeus, Jupiter, Dias Pita. For Muller all these names can be traced to the word Dias, which he understood to imply shining, or radiance. This leads to the terms Deva, Deus, Theos, as generic terms for a god, and to the names Zeus, and Jupiter derived from Deus Pater. In this way a metaphor becomes personified and ossified. This aspect of Muller's thinking was later explored similarly by Nietzsche. Topic. Gifford lectures In 1888, Muller was appointed Gifford lecturer at the University of Glasgow. These Gifford Lectures were the first in an annual series, given at several Scottish universities, that has continued to the present day. Over the next four years, Muller gave four series of lectures. The titles and order of the lectures were as follows Natural Religion. 
This first course of lectures was intended as purely introductory, and had for its object a definition of natural religion in its widest sense. Physical religion. This second course of lectures was intended to show how different nations had arrived at a belief in something infinite behind the finite, in something invisible behind the visible, in many unseen agents or gods of nature, until they reached a belief in one God above all those gods. In short, a history of the discovery of the infinite in nature. Anthropological religion. This third course was intended to show how different nations arrived at a belief in a soul, how they named its various faculties, and what they imagined about its fate after death. Theosophy or psychological religion. The fourth and last course of lectures was intended to examine the relation between God and the soul. These two infinites, including the ideas that some of the principal nations of the world have formed concerning this relation. Real religion, Muller asserted, is founded on a true perception of the relation of the soul to God and of God to the soul. Muller wanted to prove that this was true, not only as a postulate, but as an historical fact. The original title of the lectures was Psychological Religion, but Muller felt compelled to add Theosophy to it. Muller's final Gifford lecture is significant in interpreting his work broadly, as he situates his philological and historical research within a hermetic and mystical theological project. As translator In 1881, he published a translation of the first edition of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. He agreed with Schopenhauer that this edition was the most direct and honest expression of Kant's thought. His translation corrected several errors that were committed by previous translators. In his translator's preface, Muller wrote, the bridge of thoughts and sighs that spans the whole history of the Aryan world has its first arch in the Veda, its last in Kant's critique. While in the Veda we may study the childhood, we may study in Kant's critique of pure reason the perfect manhood of the Aryan mind. The materials are now accessible, and the English-speaking race, the race of the future, will have in Kant's critique another Aryan heirloom, as precious as the Veda, a work that may be criticized, but can never be ignored. Muller continued to be influenced by the Kantian transcendentalist model of spirituality, and was opposed to Darwinian ideas of human development. He argued that, "...language forms an impassable barrier between man and beast." He was also influenced by the work Thought and Reality, of the Russian philosopher African Spur. <laughs> <laughs> Views on India <laughs> <laughs> Early career In his career, Muller several times expressed the view that a reformation within Hinduism needed to occur, comparable to the Christian Reformation. In his view, if there is one thing which a comparative study of religions places in the clearest light, it is the inevitable decay to which every religion is exposed. Whenever we can trace back a religion to its first beginnings, we find it free from many blemishes that affected it in its later states. He used his links with the Brahmo Samaj to encourage such a reformation on the lines pioneered by Ram Mohan Roy. Muller believed that the Brahmos would engender an Indian form of Christianity and that they were in practice, Christians, without being Roman Catholics, Anglicans or Lutherans. In the Lutheran tradition, he hoped that the superstition and idolatry, which he considered to be characteristic of modern popular Hinduism, would disappear. Muller wrote, the translation of the Veda will hereafter tell to a great extent on the fate of India, and on the growth of millions of souls in that country. It is the root of their religion, and to show them what the root is, is, I feel sure, is the only way of uprooting all that has sprung from it during the last 3,000 years. Muller hoped that increased funding for education in India would promote a new form of literature combining Western and Indian traditions. In 1868 he wrote to George Campbell, the newly appointed Secretary of State for India, India has been conquered once, but India must be conquered again, and that second conquest should be a conquest by education. Much has been done for education of late, but if the funds were tripled and quadrupled, that would hardly be enough. By encouraging a study of their own ancient literature, as part of their education, a national feeling of pride and self-respect will be reawakened among those who influence the large masses of the people. A new national literature may spring up, impregnated with Western ideas, yet retaining its native spirit and character. A new national literature will bring with it a new national life, and new moral vigor. As to religion, that will take care of itself. 
The missionaries have done far more than they themselves seem to be aware of, nay, much of the work which is theirs they would probably disclaim. The Christianity of our 19th century will hardly be the Christianity of India. But the ancient religion of India is doomed. And if Christianity does not step in, whose fault will it be? Topic. Late career In his 60s and 70s, Muller gave a series of lectures, which reflected a more nuanced view in favor of Hinduism and the ancient literature from India. In his, What Can India Teach Us? lecture at University of Cambridge, he championed ancient Sanskrit literature in India as follows. If I were to look over the whole world to find out the country most richly endowed with all the wealth, power, and beauty that nature can bestow, in some parts a very paradise on earth, I should point to India. If I were asked under what sky the human mind has most full developed some of its choicest gifts, has most deeply pondered on the greatest problems of life, and has found solutions of some of them which well deserve the attention even of those who have studied Plato and Kant, I should point to India. And if I were to ask myself from what literature we, here in Europe, we who have been nurtured almost exclusively on the thoughts of Greeks and Romans, and of one Semitic race, the Jewish, may draw that corrective which is most wanted in order to make our inner life more perfect, more comprehensive, more universal, in fact more truly human, a life, not for this life only, but a transfigured and eternal life, again I should point to India. He also conjectured that the introduction of Islam in India in the 11th century had a deep effect on the psyche and behavior of Hindus in another lecture, Truthful Character of the Hindus. The other epic poem too, the Mahabharata, is full of episodes showing a profound regard for truth. Were I to quote from all the law books, and from still later works, everywhere you would hear the same key note of truthfulness vibrating through them all. I say once more that I do not wish to represent the people of India as 253 millions of angels, but I do wish it to be understood and to be accepted as a fact, that the damaging charge of untruthfulness brought against that people is utterly unfounded with regard to ancient times. It is not only not true, but the very opposite of the truth. As to modern times, and I date them from about 1000 after Christ AD, I can only say that, after reading the accounts of the terrors and horrors of Mohammedan rule, my wonder is that so much of native virtue and truthfulness should have survived. You might as well expect a mouse to speak the truth before a cat, as a Hindu before a Mohammedan judge. Swami Vivekananda, who was the foremost disciple of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, met Muller over a lunch on 28 May 1896. Regarding Muller and his wife, the Swami later wrote, The visit was really a revelation to me. That little white house, its setting in a beautiful garden, the silver-haired sage, with a face calm and benign, and forehead smooth as a child's in spite of seventy winters, and every line in that face speaking of a deep-seated mine of spirituality somewhere behind, that noble wife, the helpmate of his life through his long and arduous task of exciting interest, overriding opposition and contempt, and at last creating a respect for the thoughts of the sages of ancient India. The trees, the flowers, the calmness, and the clear sky. All these sent me back in imagination to the glorious days of ancient India, the days of our Brahmarshis and Rajarshis, the days of the great Vanaprasthas, the days of Arundhati's and Vasishthas. It was neither the philologist nor the scholar that I saw, but a soul that is every day realizing its oneness with the universe. Topic. Controversies Topic. Anti Christian During the course of his Gifford lectures on the subject of natural religion, Muller was severely criticized for being anti-Christian. In 1891, at a meeting of the established Presbytery of Glasgow, Mr. Thompson Minister of Ladywell moved a motion that Muller's teaching was subversive of the Christian faith, and fitted to spread pantheistic and infidel views amongst the students and others, and questioned Muller's appointment as lecturer. An even stronger attack on Muller was made by Monsignor Alexander Monroe in St. Andrew's Cathedral. Monroe, an officer of the Roman Catholic Church in Scotland and provost of the Catholic Cathedral of Glasgow from 1884 to 1892, declared that Muller's lectures were nothing less than a crusade against divine revelation, against Jesus Christ, and against Christianity. The blasphemous lectures were, he continued, the proclamation of atheism under the guise of pantheism, and uprooted our idea of God, for it repudiated the idea of a personal God. 
Similar accusations had already led to Muller's exclusion from the Bowdoin chair in Sanskrit in favor of the conservative Monier Monier Williams. By the 1880s Muller was being courted by Charles Godfrey Leland, medium and Freemason Helena Blavatsky, and other writers who were seeking to assert the merits of «pagan» religious traditions over Christianity. The designer Mary Fraser Teitler stated that Muller's book Chips from a German Workshop a collection of his essays was her «Bible» which helped her to create a multicultural sacred imagery. Muller distanced himself from these developments, and remained within the Lutheran faith in which he had been brought up. According to G. Beckerledge, Muller's background as a Lutheran German and his identification with the Broad Church Party led to suspicion by those opposed to the political and religious positions that they felt Muller represented, particularly his latitudinarianism. Although Muller took a strong religious and academic interest in Hinduism and other non Christian religions, and often compared Christianity to religions that many traditional Protestants would have regarded as primitive or false, he grounded his perennialism in a belief that Christianity possessed the fullest truth of all living religions. 21st century scholars of religion, far from accusing Muller of being anti Christian, have critically examined Muller's theological project as evidence for a bias towards Christian conceptions of God in early academic religious studies. <laughs> Darwin disagreement Muller attempted to formulate a philosophy of religion that addressed the crisis of faith engendered by the historical and critical study of religion by German scholars on the one hand, and by the Darwinian revolution on the other. He was wary of Darwin's work on human evolution, and attacked his view of the development of human faculties. His work was taken up by cultural commentators such as his friend John Ruskin, who saw it as a productive response to the crisis of the age compare Matthew Arnold's Dover Beach. He analyzed mythologies as rationalizations of natural phenomena, primitive beginnings that we might denominate protoscience within a cultural evolution. Muller also proposed an early, mystical interpretation of theistic evolution, using Darwinism as a critique of mechanical philosophy. In 1870, Muller gave a short course of three lectures for the British Institution on Language as the Barrier Between Man and Beast, which he called On Darwin's Philosophy of Language. Muller specifically disagreed with Darwin's theories on the origin of language and that the language of man could have developed from the language of animals. In 1873, he sent a copy of his lectures to Darwin reassuring him that, though he differed from some of Darwin's conclusions, he was one of his "...diligent readers and sincere admirers". <laughs> Arianism Muller's work contributed to the developing interest in Aryan culture, which often set Indo-European Aryan traditions in opposition to Semitic religions. He was deeply saddened by the fact that these classifications later came to be expressed in racist terms, as this was far from his intention. For Muller the discovery of common Indian and European ancestry was a powerful argument against racism, arguing that an ethnologist who speaks of Aryan race, Aryan blood, Aryan eyes and hair, is as great a sinner as a linguist who speaks of a dolichocephalic dictionary or a brachycephalic grammar, and that, the blackest Hindus represent an earlier stage of Aryan speech and thought than the fairest Scandinavians. Turanian <inaudible> <inaudible> Muller put forward and promoted the theory of a Turanian family of languages or speech, comprising the Finnic, Samoyedic, Tataric, Turkic, Mongolic, and Tungusic languages. According to Muller, these five languages were those spoken in Asia or Europe not included under the Aryan and Semitic families, with the exception perhaps of the Chinese and its dialects. In addition, they were nomadic languages. In contrast to the other two families Aryan and Semitic, which he called state or political languages, the idea of a Turanian family of languages was not accepted by everyone at the time. Although the term, Turanian, quickly became an archaism, unlike Aryan, it did not disappear completely. The idea was absorbed later into nationalist ideologies in Hungary and Turkey. Honors. <laughs> <laughs> 
In 1869 Muller was elected to the French Académie des Inscriptions et Belles Lettres as a foreign correspondent In June 1874 Muller was awarded the Pour le Merit civil class, much to his surprise. Soon after, when he was commanded to dine at Windsor, he wrote to Prince Leopold to ask if he might wear his order, and the wire came back, "'Not may, but must.'" In 1875 Muller was awarded the Bavarian Maximilian Order for Science and Art. The award is given to acknowledge excellent and outstanding achievements in the field of science and art. In a letter to his mother dated 19 December, Muller wrote that the award was more showy than the poor le merit, "'But that is the best.'" In 1896 Muller was appointed a member of the Privy Council. Personal life Muller became a naturalised British citizen in 1855, at the age of 32. He married Georgina Adelaide Grenfell on 3 August 1859. The couple had four children, Ada, Mary, Beatrice and Wilhelm Max, of whom two predeceased them. Georgina died 1919 had his papers and correspondence bound. They are at the Bodleian Library, Oxford. <laughs> Death and legacy Muller's health began deteriorating in 1898 and he died at his home in Oxford on 28 October 1900. He was interred at Holywell Cemetery on 1 November 1900, after his death a memorial fund was opened at Oxford for the promotion of learning and research in all matters relating to the history and archaeology, the languages, literatures, and religions of ancient India. The Goethe Institutes in India are named Max Muller Bhavan in his honour, as is a street Max Muller Marg in New Delhi. Muller's biographies include those by Lawrence van den Bosch 2002, John R. Stone 2002, and Narad C. Choudhury 19 74, the last of which was awarded the Sahitya Akademi Award for English by Sahitya Akademi, India's National Academy of Letters. Stephen G. Alters 2005 work contains a chapter on Muller's rivalry with the American linguist William Dwight Whitney. Topic publications Muller's scholarly works, published separately as well as an 18-volume collected works, include, Narayana, Friedrich Max Muller 1844. Hitopadisa, eine alt indische Fabelsammlung. Brockhaus. Friedrich Max Muller 1859. A History of Ancient Sanskrit Literature So Far As It Illustrates the Primitive Religion of the Brahmins. Williams and Norgate. Friedrich Max Muller 1866. Lectures on the Science of Language, delivered at the Royal Institution of Great Britain in April, May, and June 1861. Longman's, Green, Lectures on the Science of Language were translated into Russian in 1866 and published at the first Russian scientific linguistic magazine Philologikeski Zapiski, Chips from a German Workshop 1867-75, 5 vols, Introduction to the Science of Religion 1873, Max Muller 1878. Lectures on the Origin and Growth of Religion as Illustrated by the Religions of India. Friedrich Max Muller 1881. Critique of Pure Reason German, Critic der Reinen Vernunft, KRV, by Immanuel Kant, translated by Friedrich Max Müller. Friedrich Max Müller 1883. India, What Can It Teach Us? A Course of Lectures Delivered Before the University of Cambridge. Longmans, Green. Biographical Essays 1884 Upanishads. Wordsworth Editions, 1 January 2000. ISBN 978-1-84022-102-2. The German Classics from the 4th to the 19th Century. Scribner's, 1886. Muller, F. Max, MacDonnell, Arthur Anthony, 1886. A Sanskrit Grammar for Beginners. Archive.org in English and Slovak. London, Longman, Green & Co. p. 208. Archived from the original on October 18, 2018. The Science of Thought, 1887, 2 vols, Studies in Buddhism. Asian Educational Services, 1999. ISBN 978-81-206-1226-6. Six Systems of Hindu Philosophy, 1899, Gifford Lectures of 1888-92, Collected Works, Vols. 
1 to 4 natural religion 1889 physical religion 1891 anthropological religion 1892 theosophy or psychological religion 1893 Auld Lang Syne 1898 Two Vols a memoir my autobiography a fragment 1901 Friedrich Max Müller GAM Georgina Adelaide Müller 1902 The Life and Letters of the Right Honorable Friedrich Max Müller Longmans Green Topic references Topic Notes Lawrence van den Bosch 2002. Friedrich Max Müller, A Life Devoted to Humanities. E. J. Brill. ISBN 978-90-04-12505-6. John R. Stone, 6 December 2002. The Essential Max Müller, On Language, Mythology, and Religion. Palgrave Macmillan. ISBN 978-0-312-29309-3. Narad C. Choudhury Scholar Extraordinary, The Life of Professor the R.T. Hun, Friedrich Max Müller. Chateau and Windus. Stephen G. Alter The, 9th of March 2005. the Battle with Max Müller. William Dwight Whitney and the Science of Language. Johns Hopkins University Press. pp. 174-207. ISBN 978-0-8018-8020-9. Stefan Arvidsson 2006. Indo-European Mythology as Ideology and Science. University of Chicago Press. ISBN 9780226028606. Archived from the original on 21 December 2016. John R. Davis and Angus Nichols, eds. 2017 Friedrich Max Müller and the Role of Philology in Victorian Thought. Routledge. John R. Davis and Angus Nichols 2016. Friedrich Max Müller, The Career and Intellectual Trajectory of a German Philologist in Victorian Britain. Publications of the English Goethe Society 85, No. 2-3 2016, 67-97 Ari Molendi 2016. Friedrich Max Müller and the Sacred Books of the East, Oxford University Press. Further reading Joan Leopold. Steinthal and Max Müller, Comparative Lives. Chajim H. Steinthal, Sprachwissenschalter und Philosoph im 19. Jarundert. Linguist and Philosopher in the 19th Century, eds. Hartwick Weedbach and Annette Winkelmann. Leiden, Boston, Köln, Brill, 2002 equals Studies in European Judaism, IV, pp. 31-49. Joan Leopold. Max Müller and the Linguistic Study of Civilization and Editor. Friedrich Max Müller. Comparative Philology of the Indo-European Languages in its Bearing on the Early Civilization of Mankind 1849, in Contributions to Comparative Indo-European, African and Chinese Linguistics, Max Müller and Steinthal. Dordrecht and Boston, Springer, 1999, pp. 1 206, equals pre Volney essay series, 3, with full bibliography of works. Joan Leopold. Ethnic Stereotypes in Linguistics, The Case of Friedrich Max Müller. Papers in the History of Linguistics, delivered at Princeton, 1984, eds. H. Arsliff, L. G. Kelly, and H. J. Niederihe. Amsterdam and Philadelphia, J. Benjamins, 1987, pp. 501-12. Joan Leopold. Friedrich Max Müller and the Question of the Early Indo-Europeans Etudes inter ethniques, analyse du centre d'études supérieures et de recherches sur les relations ethniques et le racisme Paris, 7 1984, 21-32. Joan Leopold. British Anwendungen der Erischen Rassentheorie auf Indien 1850-70. Seculum, 25, 386-411, trans, of following item Joan Leopold. British Applications of the Aryan Theory of Race to India 1850-70. The English Historical Review, LXXXIX 578-603, winner of University's Essay Prize, Royal Asiatic Society, London Joan Leopold. The Aryan Theory of Race in India 1870-1920. 
The Indian Economic and Social History Review, 7 271 97 External links Max Muller, 2011. In Encyclopædia Britannica. Retrieved from http colon slash slash www.britannica.com slash ebchect slash topic slash three nine six eight three three slash max dash muller Works by Max Muller at Project Gutenberg Works by or about Max Muller at Internet Archive Works by Max Muller at LibriVox Public Domain Audiobooks Deutsche Lieb, novel by F. Max Muller 1857, e-book edition 2011 German, Philipp Grieb IT Redaction Online Library of Liberty, Friedrich Max Muller Gifford Lectures Series, Biography, Friedrich Max Muller by Dr. Brannon Hancock Lawrence P. van den Bosch. Theosophy or Pantheism? Friedrich Max Muller's Gifford Lectures on Natural Religion. Full text of the article Vedas and Upanishads Vivekananda on Max Muller Friedrich Max Muller, The Hymns of the Rigveda, with Sayana's Commentary London, 1849-74, 2nd ed. 4 vols, Oxford, 1890-92. PDF format.